<laughs> I haven't even started. Afternoon, everybody. How are you all doing? Good. Almost there, right? End of her, or this is the second day, second day. So um, we're here today. I don't know if we have a clicker, if I could grab that from somebody. Otherwise, we're gonna just have the really nice title slide. <laughs> Pardon me for a second. Sorry. Kristen to the rescue. Yay. Round of applause for Kristen. She's gonna be <laughs> All right, so. Let's see if I got this. I do. All right, so my name is Matt. I'm from the University of Central Florida, and we're here today to talk a little bit about accessibility and game design. And today we're bringing together different panel or different uh, perspectives on this panel, and each of us have our own unique take on accessibility in games. And so this panel is made up of, like I said, a lot of different perspectives. Uh, we have Karen, who's a leader in accessibility with Electronic Arts. Uh, Peter and myself are professors at the University of Central Florida, and we work for a company called Limitless Solutions, which we'll tell you more about. We have Milad, who's a developer and an avid gamer, and he works with Neil Squire. And then we have Keith, who is an advocate, gamer, user. And so you'll get all of our perspectives on approaches for accessibility in design for gaming. So we're going to start just by telling a little bit about ourselves and our perspectives, and I'm gonna hand it over to Karen here to uh, take the lead. There you go. All right, thank you. Um, there we go. So I'm Karen Stevens. I'm the EA Sports Accessibility Lead. Um, I, my basic role is to make EA's games more playable by those with disabilities. And I've been do, having this role full-time now for a full year, and before that point, it was sort of a side job that ended up taking over my life, which I'm perfectly okay with. Uh, but I'm really originally a, a rendering developer, like I used to make Madden's skin look pretty and stuff like that, so it was a bit of a jump. <laughs> but I really love working with our, um, our audience. I've been with the company since Madden 25, which was 2013. And I noticed the game wasn't colorblind friendly, and it had other issues where I had like a legal Uber friend who told me that he couldn't play the game. And I'm like, well, that's a problem. If I ever get a chance to do something about that, I will. So this is the boards I had for my 2014 game jam, which I proposed Madden accessibility features, and that's what started it all. And that's when I was allowed to start putting things in Madden because this won big time. <laughs> so, and by the way, this step was, um, that, this was actually a picture that was taken earlier this year. That's why the board looks so sad at this point. It looks even worse now to the last office move. <laughs> Here's an example of the, what was in Madden 17. It was the first time we had an accessibility area in any menu. Um, and we had brightness, contrast, colorblind support, and then the ability to make things large. I have lots of uh, presentations online that cover this. Just look up my name, you'll find them. Um, as the, yeah, as the uh, accessibility lead, basically I, I'm able to put things on the schedule for sports titles. I also review any game of anybody who asks me internally. And uh, I have an internal website I use for any question or type of uh, data somebody wants. So the next person I can just give a link to. And the role's evolving. So I know it's gonna be different next year than it is this year and it'll keep going, which is great. And this is an example now, we're mad at 19 as to how we've advanced. You saw the 17 had an accessibility section. Now we have an entire menu. So, and it's going from there. That's just an example, and that's happening across titles. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, EA underscore accessible, and that's where I post anything new or answer any questions. You can also reach me at able, A-B-L-E, at EA.com, or you can go to EA.com slash able for more information on accessibility. Um, the reason why we use, I'm using able is because it fits in one line of braille on a business card where my original email address does not. <laughs> so, you know, trying to keep everything as accessible as possible. I'm Peter Smith. I'm an assistant professor of game design at UCF, and I'm working with uh, Matt Dombrowski, who introduced himself a little earlier. There's a picture of us. Uh, we should have picked one where you could see Matt, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we did take it here in Vancouver. Uh, we work with a group called Limitless uh, Solutions, and they make uh, really low-cost 3D printed prosthetic arms for kids, and Matt's going to tell you a little bit about that part. Yeah, so when I'm not photobombing Peter, 
uh, in, yeah. in pictures. Uh, we do work for Limitless Solutions. And uh, I, I'm really happy Peter and I could be here for this event because we are from academia. Uh, we, I, I come from a motion graphics background where I did jumbotrons and animation and all sorts of cool things. But it is all about user experience no matter what we do. We are communicators and it's about, our, in the end, our user. And with Limitless, uh, it's all about the power of expression. So as Peter briefly mentioned, we design 3D printed prosthetic arms for children and we provide them free of charge to the families. And our ultimate goal is no child should have to pay for a limb. And it's really amazing what creative elements like these arms or like video games can do for a child's competence. And Peter and I got involved with Limitless about three years ago and uh, the stories we've, we've gotten and the experiences we've had were really amazing. Limitless kind of came to the forefront, if you've seen on YouTube, a video of Robert Downey Jr. giving out a 3D printed Iron Man arm to a little boy. That was one of our arms, and he was very gracious to do that. But it's more than just the limb. It's more than just picking things up. It's about, about Wyatt there, who's uh, with Blue Man Group. Blue Man Group is a, if, if those aren't familiar, they use the power of music and color and expression and other ways of communication other than vocal to uh, empower children. And Wyatt is on the non or was on the nonverbal spectrum. He's autistic. He, uh, in that picture, is eight or nine years old. I kid you not now, Wyatt got his Blue Man Group arm and we can't get him to stop talking. <laughs> If he were at this event, I wouldn't get a word in edgewise. He would be up here doing the talk for us. He is an amazing young man. And Wyatt is now 15 years old, about as tall as me. He's going to be one of our first bionic kids. He's a bionic teen now, but who will go to UCF. So the power that these, these tools have for these children is really, really impressive. And with Peter and I, uh, we, I was approached by the founders of Limitless uh, they wanted to design the, the sleeves of the arm, and I made an offhanded comment and a joke really about the power glove, the old Nintendo power glove. I said, wouldn't it be cool to actually have a video game controller with that prosthetic sleeve? And they looked at me and jaws dropped and they said, yes, do it. And I went, uh-oh, I'm, I'm the art guy, right? I'm like, uh-oh, what would he do? So I reached out to Peter Smith, and he'll tell you a little so bit about that. Matt has a tendency of showing up in my office and going, I agreed to do this thing. How are we, how are we going to do it? <laughs> and I'll go, uh, yes. we'll do this. <laughs> yeah, and we'll figure it out. But uh, we, we put together a controller that's kind of Arduino-based and used the same sensor that was in the uh, original arm. So when you flex, the way the arm works, when you flex, it opens. When you flex again, it closes. It's how the, like a kind of a garage door opener control. And we made a series of kind of one button games. The first game we made, we thought, kids are going to love this. Because we were like, what would you do if, uh, you know, what game would you like to use the most if you are making something with your hand as a little kid? And we were like, obviously a game where they pick their nose. <laughs> like, it just seemed like obvious to us. Like, that's what kids would do. And we made this thing called Who Knows, where you could uh, pick your nose. And you'd flex, and your finger would go up in the nose. And you'd flex again, and it would, like, dig around for stuff. And then. <laughs> You flex again and they, they pull out something like a Lego block or um, an old prospector would come out and go, um, what's going on out there every now and then? Anyway, the kids hated the game. They, <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, yeah. yeah, they did not like that one. And they told us. They, yeah, they, they were just like, this shy. one's not great. Yeah. And we, we had made um, like four or five other games at the time. And the one that we thought probably wasn't going to be the best one um, was. Like, they loved this game called Smash Bro. And uh, we changed the name for um, obvious reasons. Uh, <laughs> it's now called Bash and Debris. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the kids just were, they really took to it and played it. Uh, we have a story where, like, uh, in fact, the kid there playing uh, Who Knows, um, somebody came up behind him, our, our uh, mascot, Nitro, came with, like, hitting him with a sword, and he wouldn't turn around and look at him. He was just playing the game. It's like in the zone. And it was one of those moments where, you know, Peter and I never thought we would be in prosthetic limb design. And it, it's amazing where life takes you, especially all of us being creatives and the paths that are opened. But that's the moment right there where Zach, like Peter and I are like behind the camera right there. And when he lit up and played this game, it changed our world. I left and I looked at Peter and I said, we got to do this right. There's no in between. There's no 
this is one project and we move on. This is this changed the way we think about design, which was pretty cool. And um, you can see here uh, Annika, and she's wearing one of our custom controllers that Peter was talking uh, talked about, and it is an EMG controller. And Peter, you can yeah. So EMG reads uh, like how much you're flexing your muscles. So it's, we can get a number between zero and a thousand when someone flexes. Um, we, we to start with, we were using it as a one button controller. Uh, the, the model there is kind of our new version of it, which is a combination of 3D printed and silicone, and also we're working with the Microsoft Adaptive Controller now to see if we can get it all integrated into one environment, so we'll be able to use it to play regular games. Um, in the picture, actually, you can see there uh, Annika is using a uh, regular Xbox 360 controller. We now use a one-handed controller. We figured out quickly that we can't just use that controller. Yeah. And it's about adaptability. And really, the Bionic kids were our inspiration. But like we said, they told us when it sucked. They told us when it was bad. They did not shy away at all. And we would have our game designers and our interns come in and write. And our interns are made up, by the way, we have about 30 interns who are engineers, artists, uh, communications majors, health and public affairs. And we all come together for the greater purpose, which is our Bionic kids. And so. They wrote stories about the games, and it, it became more than participatory design. It kind of became this cooperative inquiry between the, the, the audience and the designer where the lines were blurred. And you know, they wanted a space level. They wanted sharks with lasers on their head. They wanted goats that could fly and shoot things. So we gave them those things. Yeah, we started with just that one level in the top, uh, top right. And now we have six or seven levels. We have uh, a different characters, so you can be Bash or Debris. Matt and I have been debating on if Bash and Debris are dating or not, but the kids will let us know. <laughs> That'll be the way it is. And uh, this game's really evolved into something special uh, and is probably the best game that we have for the first generation of ARMS. So as Peter mentioned, there are newer generations of ARMS. Our initial ARMS, the Iron Man ARM, for instance, just opened and closed. It was like a binary, like a garage door opener. And these newer ARMS have fully gestural controls. So how do I tell anyone who uses a prosthetic limb to, oh, you need to flex 30% to get it to point? or you need to flex 60% to get it to make a fist. If I asked each of you to do that, each of us would have a different value of our flex. So we had to create a more, um, not complex game, but a more uh, focused interface that worked with our, our children. And you can see here the calibration tool, and Pete, you can, Pete's the smarter yeah, one. So the two, this so. calibration <laughs> actually has a high and low for how, how you flex. So you'll have like a natural resting amount. And when you flex your full amount, you wouldn't hit 1,000. You'd probably hit like 200 or something like that. So we're able to set a gauge. And then we can um, treat this like an analog input. And the cool thing about that is um, now when you flex in, in this new game called Magical Savior of Friends, um, you want to go to the next slide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Um, on this slide, um, you can actually see the, the arm next to the character in the top left of the GIF there, or GIF. One. Um, <laughs> whichever one you like better. <laughs> anyway, uh, depending upon how much you flex, you get a different power. So they did kind of the, the light flex, they get that circle, and the medium flex, they get that shotgun type blast that's going to happen now. Yeah. And then there's also not shown here another blast that goes all the way across the screen. So we can really change out the, the power. So when you see the circle blast, just think of it as a point. And when you see the, uh, the, the pronged blast, think of it as maybe an OK sign. And the, we can customize these experiences. And we're doing this through the use of basically an input and output and a ground sticker that reads the voltage that their brain sends to their muscles. And it's pretty amazing. And our next kind of journey into the accessibility game design is Project Xavier, because we're a little bit dorky. <laughs> and it's a face-controlled wheelchair. And it uses the same EMG technology. And it can control the wheelchair to go left, right, forward, and back. And you use your temporalis muscles by simply clenching your jaw. It will activate your muscle, and you can drive a wheelchair. So the first game we thought of creating was a, of course, like a Mario Kart-style racing game. So we're currently in development there. And we have a much cooler headband. and and the wires eventually go to Bluetooth upon production. But the goal is to, again, provide this free of charge 
and uh, the, the, these kids don't have game experiences like we have. And it is really important that they do. And it's, it's you know, they've been our greatest influence as designers and people in general. I mean, they made Peter and I much better people. And we want to do everything to empower them. And uh, last week, we actually had a, a friend come in. His name was Michael, and Michael has cerebral palsy. And we uh, hooked the adapt uh, Microsoft Adaptable Controller up. We, all, we had a series of buttons that he could push. And then we also used the EMG controller, and he got to play some of these games. And it was a really, really cool experience. And um, yeah, so that's basically what we do and how we approach it. And I'm going to hand it over to Milad and uh, go from there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. So my name is Milad. I am a hardware and software developer, and I enjoy creating software and hardware that can help improve lives of other people and myself. I work at uh, the R&D department of Needed Quiet Society, which is a Canadian national non for profit organization that helps to empower Canadians with disabilities. The, we can continue. So the R and D team has been involved with creating many uh, the assistive technologies over the last thirty years. One of the good examples is a lip sync, which is a sip and pop mouse operated USB mouse device, which you can basically use to operate your computer or your Android phone. Okay, good. Okay, in 2016, the Needle Squire Society received a grant from through the Google Impact Challenge to create the open source version of the lip sync, which would cost under $300 uh, cost of component to create. We are actually just released the joystick version of the lifting called Gainless Stick, which is basically a mouse operated and zip uh, operated joystick controller. And you can find all the information on how to make a lifting and how to get involved at makersmakingchange.com. Makers Making Change is an initiative by Neil Aspire, which helps to connect makers, OTs, and those who need assistive technologies. So you can go to the website and find lots of other interesting projects, or you can post your own project and get involved. We also host events around uh, the Canada and the US. The one of the first events that we hosted was an active makeathon, which one of the teams created a, a custom accessible, accessible V controller for Timothy to help him be able to play his favorite games which you can see he's very happy playing his games. So next. Okay, so we also supervise and sponsor university capstone teams uh, uh, to help create uh, customized controllers for local gamers. I'm going to show you two examples of the project that I supervise. The first one is a one-handed controller for Mark, who is, uh, who is able to only use his right arm. So this is a design that the team came up with. OK, so the project, the development process, involves uh, creating a custom 3D, 3D printed housing, and we de they designed it in a way to fit his arm. 
So it also involved using custom vintage circuit board and open source hardware such as Arduino Micro. And also they created a open source software for it. Next slide. So the second project was a modular accessible controller for Kaylin, which has a limited range of motion in her hands. So the team came up with this design, which involves a elbow joystick and two four sensing buttons. So unfortunately, the joy at the elbow joystick didn't work as a reliable solution after going through the testing process. Because as you can see, each wheelchair is designed differently based on the user need. So fitting the, the, joystick, the elbow joystick in a place that would work every day wasn't a very reliable solution. So she switched her to the, to the lip sync and she's able to play very well, if you go next. So that's, the, that's her playing uh, their favorite game, which is Need for a Speed Hot Pursuit 2 from 2002, I believe. So she's uh, using lip sync both through the, the WASD keyboard and also the, the adaptive Xbox controller, which both of them work very well. So finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my own experience with gaming and my own solution. So I'm a big fan of FIFA game series, and I've been a PlayStation user for about 20 years, I would say. So as the game improved quite a lot through the 20 years, the range of motion and dexterity in my hands declined. So as a result, I slowly started to look at other solutions to help me to be able to play at the same level. Unfortunately, I didn't find a very good solution for console gaming. So I told to myself, what if I make my own? So I looked at the internet and found some components and I designed my own printed circuit board, which you can see. And then I wrote my own code in Python, which I'm hoping to open source it very soon. So this is this was obviously before the the, the release of the Xbox adaptive controller, which is a great solution and a basically a foundation for future of the gaming and include many people in the gaming that they weren't included before. So I think it's similar to a wheelchair. When you want to buy a new wheelchair, they have the foundation, which is a base. But then based on your own needs, they customize it based on your all needs. So what I think the Xbox controller is doing is basically it's a base, and then you add uh, what you need based on your needs to get it working. So I think it's, it's a great solution. But what if you want to play a game with your friend, but he or she doesn't own the Xbox? Then what do you do? So I'm just I leave you with one question or maybe a thought. But if you had a more a standard input method or protocol across all the consoles to make the gaming experience and more accessible 
experience for everybody. Okay, I let Keith yep. continue. Keith? Yep. Yeah, so my name's Keith. Uh, I go by the name uh, Arion Online. Uh, I don't have any special job like everyone else here, but uh, I do have a lot of experience playing video games. Um, I, used, I started streaming on Twitch. And actually, you can flip to the next slide. I started t streaming on Twitch kind of pretty much when it started-ish, or like the first year. And I ended up doing a stream where I, I my friend, I was, so originally I was trying to raise money for um, Muscular Dishery Walkathon that we have every year for that charity. And um, one of my friends I played WoW with forever was like, why don't you stream it? You can probably raise lots of money. Um, and I did, and I set it up so everyone can see how I played. So, at, but um, I'll actually get to that in a few slides from now. First, I'm going to kind of go through my history of playing games and all the devices I've used in. So I started out really young. And I, for this one, I had to have slings holding my arms up. And I had enough movement in my arm to move the mouse. And then from there, I used like, um, the SNES and NES and all that. I used um, my face, basically. So I used my chin and my nose hit the buttons. And I can play those pretty decently in most games. Some games are a little bit harder. Um, so next slide. When I got a little bit older, I contacted um, an organization we have in BC called Tetra. And basically, they help you with getting equipment that isn't necessarily covered by anything else. Um, so if you try to go to, like, through the government or through charities and whatnot, um, if you can't get it covered, they'll help you. And they hook you up with a retired engineer. And, or engineer or anyone in the profession that fits what you want. Um, so they hooked me up with two guys. I mean, can go to the next slide. And they helped me make this little joystick. Um, and I used my chin to move the mouse. I had buttons by my elbows and knees to do all the buttons for that. Um, it, the only issue with this is it took a lot of work to like set up. I had to be in my wheelchair, which I actually have a really hard time staying in my wheelchair for long periods of time. Um, so I ended up moving towards PC gaming. There's the next slide. And these are the first few things I used. So the mouse, the, I used that with my chin. And I, it mounted basically on my wheelchair in front of me. I used my chin and my lips to move it. And then I also tried a little bit uh, later, um, that little camel looking like thing is actually a sensor. And you put like a little sticker on your forehead. And you move your, it around to move the mouse on the screen. And it sets it up so to do clicks, you idle on a spot for like a second or two. Um, and then it'll do like a lock click and that kind of stuff. Um, it's horrible use for gaming if you want to play against other people. The delay is horrible. It's just not great. <laughs> um, so next one. So this is from uh, when I was streaming early on. Sorry for the bad quality of the picture. But it's um, basically I had to, to use a computer, I've always lied down and typed with a pen in my mouth. And then to use the mouse, I used my cheek and my earlobe. So that's why I had to wear headsets with only one ear, which was super annoying. And then also back then, I would use voice dictation to do actions um, for playing like League of Legends, like, you know, like your Q ability. So I'd have it set up so I'd say the word quack, and it would use Q. Uh, this was really funny when I was streaming, because I would just be saying like quack, waffles, <laughs> all that, like just random things like that. And then also viewers got a kick out of it, because Dragon, naturally speaking, it definitely does not always hear you right. So instead of using like my Q ability, they would like use my flash into the enemy team, and I'd die. Um, so yeah, they liked that a lot. I did not like it that much. Um, and also, back then, it had about like a 300 to 500 MS leg, which is horrible if you're playing against other people. So, um, and so next slide. I ended up getting um, these switches. And they're mounted on cardboard, because my grandpa is very tech savvy. Um, and I had an uh, interface. I forgot to add a picture of it. But it's like a little box. And it, you basically, you can plug these switches into it. And it's similar to how the Xbox accessible controller works. But you have to do like programming of it. Um, and yeah, I'll actually have a picture of that later on. Um, we can go to the next slide. So I ended up upgrading for cardboard. Um, and the biggest thing with using any setup I've had is like remappable keys is the most important thing. So yeah, I always look for that. Uh, and then also on the tip there, having a training mode is actually really awesome. 
That's one of the only reasons I could play Overwatch is because I can load into a little training lobby, set up my controls, figure out how I want to use the mouse, all that kind of stuff. Um, so next one. So this is kind of what I'm using now. Oh yeah, there's that box. Okay, so I didn't remember it. Um, so I had two switches by my elbow added, and then I had uh, five switches by my foot, and I typed on the keyboard. And it works pretty well, and actually this is what I use for pretty much 90% of my gaming, because I don't need to set it much up. Um, the key binds take maybe five minutes, and I'm good to go for most games. Um, so next screen. So these are other things I've tried. I was on the like, testing program for the, the Xbox uh, controller, and that was really fun. And then also the quad stick, which is that little joystick next to it. And it has basically, it's interfacing, like you move it with your mouse like to move the mouse, and then you blow into each hole, and they can be either, like they're based off like actually the pressure of your blowing too. So you have like a really uh, fast blow, and it'll do a different function than a soft blow, and that kind of stuff. And you can mix and match them, so like you blow into two instead of one. And it's super complicated, and it's really daunting to get set up, and I'll show you why in a second. Um, and then that last device down below, it's um, called Emotive, and it's kind of similar to what um, my friends here were talking about with reading the brainwaves. And uh, I've never personally tried it, because I heard it has like a 500 MS leg still, and it, you can only wear it for like a couple hours, and you have to take it off, and, and it's super expensive, so, um, but yeah. Uh, next slide. Um, so yeah, this is, when I start a game now, what are the things that I have to worry about for someone in my situation? Uh, can I even play the game? It's always good to know. What equipment do I need to use? Um, because I have like dozens of little things I can switch in and out. Um, will playing a lot hurt me? Uh, right now I have really bad chronic back pain, so I can't play for long periods of time. And some kind of games are more stressful to the back, so it kind of depends on the game. Um, and then how should I program a game, and can I be competitive? That's very important to me. I'm a very competitive person. Um, so yeah, it's like some games I get really frustrating, like shooting games, because I can't move the mouse well enough to even kill bots in the game. So I usually avoid those kind of games. Um, but games like League of Legends or World of Warcraft, I was always competitive and enjoyed doing that for that reason. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, so like I said, starting a game can take a long time depending on the game. Um, I'll show you next slide, which we can just jump to there. So yeah, this uh, spreadsheet is basically what I need to do for the quad stick. Uh, and that's only one page. Uh, profiles can, up to, can have up to like six pages. They can be twice as long as this. And it can vary depending on this. Like, you can have it set so you want different modes for swimming in the game versus flying, and it, you have to train your mind, it's super complicated. Um, the thing next to it is what I have to do to program my feet switches. Uh, it's not that bad. Um, the program is not currently supported anymore, though, unfortunately, so it runs really slowly on uh, updated computers. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, yeah, so these are kind of my main things that I focus on in games. Um, and actually, lower difficulty setting uh, has really hit home recently for me while I was playing the new Tomb Raider game, because how they separated the different difficulties. Um, I ended up, like, I have trouble with the FPS shooting, so I was able to turn that on low or normal, and I had the puzzle and all, the jumping and all that stuff on uh, higher difficulties, because I do like challenges in the games. So having that choice was really cool, because otherwise I probably, this is the first Tomb Raider game I've been able to play, so it's pretty cool they have that kind of stuff. And then, um, Sandbox mode for training. Um, I don't see this that much in games. I know World of Warcraft lets you do trials for max level characters, which I find very valuable for figuring out what character would be best for my, how I play. Um, but it, I don't think enough games let you experience the end game before buying the game. I, I know some, there's reasons for that for some games, but I think it can definitely be something on people's minds. And I think we're going into our discussion questions now, right? Cool, thank you. All right, so that 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 one chart always gets me because it's what did you say? It was Grand Theft Auto Five? Yeah, that was one of the ones I pulled, and that was only yeah. one page. That's like one five. page of yeah. it, which is yeah. absolutely amazing. So we have some discussions uh, just to kind of throw around, but uh, we'll also open it up to questions after this. 
for everyone to uh, ask questions. Um, but so how important is participatory design in developing an, an accessible game experience? And so I will kind of I, throw that out to the panel. I can jump on that. Um, especially if you're using, like recently I've done testing for the Xbox controller, which is really cool. I actually, for me, for my setup, it's not a great device, but I instantly recognize all the uses it would have for other people um, with uh, like needs for that kind of stuff. And also, I can look at any video game, and in the first 10 minutes, I'll know if it's going to be playable for everyone else. Like, and you can tell they've never had anyone else with those kind of that lens look at the game when it's something really super obvious. So like, that's, it's super important to have different people looking at the game for different uh, experiences for that reason. Yeah. I hate to interrupt, but I have to ask a question. Mm. Do you need help with your collar at all? Me? Oh, okay, just checking. Because I, I could oh, look like you may, oh, have okay. had, you may have had a stoma with something covering it, and I've been sitting here uh, going, no. I please, I hope I'm not <laughs> watching yourself, okay? Suffocate. <laughs> so thanks, yeah. that's it. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else want to jump in on that? or? Oh, yeah, so, uh, it, you know, from our presentation, you know already, like, we can't really do anything without the input from the kids. Like, when we make the decisions just completely on our own, we tend to make the wrong ones. And, yeah, uh, yeah. so um, without the, this is why we put the question in, I guess, is that without participatory design, um, as designers, we are not able to make the best decisions for this population. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to add something. So when we did the Cobblestone project, so we had every two weeks meeting with the actual user to make sure it's, it's designed well for her. So I think it's very important because they sometimes see something that you may not see unless you are in the same situation. So I think that's very important. I think it's super important too. Um, that one of the reasons I created the um, forums off of ea.com slash able is so people can give better feedback that's actually logged in a database and has a permanent record as opposed to email and things they were passing out before that point. And most of the things like the features that were added to Madden came from outside. So the features I added so totally blind people could play came from the blind community. They invited me to their own forum and we have a super long thread on Madden because Madden comes out every year so they know what we're doing. And we ended up with the, if you go on ea.com slash able, there's a 25 page manual on how to play Madden 18. So, and that all came from that community. Um, and then we use that input going forward for all of our games just in general. So yeah, that, it's super important. So what current trends, and we heard a little bit about the Microsoft uh, controller, which is pretty cool, uh, excite you all? What is mm -hmm. the current trends for accessibility gaming or inclusive Access gaming? Accessibility is a thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, ha I actually have a job that is 100% accessibility. That <laughs> is something you would never consider five years ago. Yeah. Um, we have the accessible controller on the Xbox, same thing. You wouldn't expect that until now it's considered more common. We have people asking Q&A here about, so what do you think about accessibility? Where I'm sure five years ago that wouldn't have happened. So my biggest thing is that accessibility actually exists now. There are accessibility menus in some games. It's becoming more popular and it's getting recognition that it really desperately needs. I'd like to ask a question just of the audience. Uh, how many of you have an accessibility lead like Karen at your studio? Hmm. <laughs> we have Karen. We have, yeah, you have Karen. Like, yeah. All the EA yeah. people have Karen. Yeah. How, how many people here have me being your accessibility lead? <laughs> yeah, so, all right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And by the way, um, I actually do support all of EA. So if anybody who's not in sports does have questions, I am available for you. So yeah, I think that's that's a really good question, Pete. Just to kind of see the the hands that didn't go up, and you know the, the steps to take next. But and if you're in the Vancouver area, um, Keith could help you out, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I'm a lot, obviously. They're both <laughs> yeah. Um, I think also for me, like just going back to Tomb Raider, because I played it recently. Um, one of the features that I haven't really seen up until now is instead of like having like spamming buttons for like a quick time, you can just hold it. And I, that makes such a difference for people with disabilities. And I don't imagine it being that difficult. I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, it's just something that people don't think of unless they have that need. 
Um, so yeah. Yeah, I can say that if that was a trend earlier, I may have not destroyed my hands. Yeah. I have yeah. tendonitis in my wrists and thumbs from playing games, especially shooters. Yeah. And I got to the point where I couldn't play at all. Now I cannot play any game like that anymore. It's impossible. So mm -hmm. I've been playing things like Diablo, where you, you can hold down the button. Mm -hmm. um, for me, my issues are relatively minor in the spectrum, but it still matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and I think, so this isn't like really a trend yet. But I think it's going to be coming up soon is realization that accessibility features aren't just for people who are in need of like people could use the Xbox controller for their regular gaming. They just have a switch by their foot and you just use your controller. Like you can just up your game doing that and it's totally fine. So there's like and even features that you're commonly found in the accessibility tab would help people. Like um, when I was working at my old job on doing uh, working at Apple for sales, um, we'd always come in, have people come in asking for help with like their devices. Um, and most of them, the answers for them are actually in the accessibility section, but they don't consider themselves to be disabled in any way or like have that thought um, until you show them the setting. So a lot of it, I think, is the trend that's going to come up soon is the realization that, hey, these benefit everyone, <laughs> not just people who need them, like everyone needs them. So, yeah. yeah. All right, so we talked a little bit about what's working and um, that's important. And I think we kind of covered uh, what, what trends you're looking for. So I'm gonna just kind of skip to the, the next one unless anyone wants to chime in. But um, you briefly mentioned this and this is why I wanted to skip to this one. What are your thoughts on the potential of all types of gamers using these controllers uh, to enhance their gameplay? And this is kind of a mixed bag depending on who you talk to, but I was just curious on your thoughts. So yeah. using these assistive devices to kind of get that competitive edge, especially in competitive gaming. I have no issue with it. I mean, personally, my thought is, especially when it comes to software settings, if everybody has access to the same settings and they can all turn it on, it's still a level playing field. Yeah. You can choose to turn it on, you can choose not to turn it on, but as long as everybody has access to the same thing, it shouldn't be considered um, an advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. I, I think for most gameplay enhancements, like my example I just said a minute ago is like, like a really good example of um, how I think people can use technology and like add them together. But like, I think it'll be when we get AR and virtual reality kind of stuff accessible. I think that's when you'll see kind of an enhancing of gameplay. Because you could use, like people with disabilities could use AR and VR with the head controller probably pretty easily if it's designed properly. Um, and so could regular people with their really regular controllers too, so yeah. So I'm going to just add up something. As an example, the Google Books, they were made for all the people, but it uh, affected those with uh, visual impairment. Because in the past, they had to wait to get that books in the braille. But with the Google book, they can just read earlier. They can use text to speech. So they don't need to wait for the braille version of the book. So I think that benefited everybody. So that's, that's a good example. Yeah. Um, I was just going to add one more thing. I know when it comes to like actual like, competitive tournaments and whatnot, that's totally different discussion that's really complicated because like, I guess if the setting's available, like Karen said, it should be okay. But there's definitely a lot of communities that would rather it just be played vanilla to, for their like top competition. So that's, I think, would be another huge debate on whether you'd want to see it at that level. Personally, I'd be fine with it. But yeah, I can see people not being fine with it for some really silly reason. I think a lot of it I consider the difference between automatic and manual transmission. You probably can tweak more out of it with manual transmission so somebody using it gets, you know, can do it. However, if that's just too complicated for whatever reason, it's not that automatic is really giving you an advantage. In fact, if anything, it's actually a disadvantage because you can tweak more out of manual than you can automatic, but it lets more people use a car. So I see it kind of the same. Yeah. That's a great answer. All right, so finally, our crystal ball. <laughs> what would you like to see in the future of accessibility design? What, what, what is, you know, we talked a little bit about cross-platform devices, uh, for one, kind of, kind of blurring those lines between the, the big consoles and so forth, but what do you 
same. I personally would love to see it integrated into every phase of the design process for all games. Yeah. Because it's cheap if you do it early yeah. most of the time. So like if it's, it's something like the font size is too small. If you know that from day one that your font size has to be a certain size, there's no additional cost. It's, yeah. it's just that. Um, and it makes for a better product in the end. Uh, I think for me, um, it actually has to do with making the games and like who you're hiring to make the games. Like I've done modding for um, back when Arc came out, I was doing Unreal modding, and the tools that are for making games are not accessible. Like there's not enough ways to make it so it's comfortable and easy to use. For me to actually do the modding I wanted to do for Arc would take me probably twice as long as someone else just because the tool is in design right. So I think that's a big part about moving accessibility design forward is actually making the tools to make the games accessible to you. So I, the thing we get asked the most is how we can um, play Fortnite with our controller, right? <laughs> like how can I play Fortnite or how can I play uh, Minecraft or mm -hmm. just how can I play with my cousin? And uh, so I'd like to see it where all the controllers we're building get just integrated. Like plug and play. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, I think we have some time for, yes, we do. We have time for questions. But thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. And thank you. Hi, um, quick question. So one thing we know from a lot of accessibility research is that the options for accessibility are used by able-bodied people all the time, mm -hmm. right? This is, it's an easy win for everybody. So I'm wondering if you guys know, what would a better term be to try and get people to find those? Because it seems like one way that we could use, one lever we could use to get this more in more games is to make it more prominent for all of our users. Mm. So. I'm going to admit that I'm pretty much deaf, and I didn't catch that. So I'm going to ask you, to, one of you, to repeat this to me <laughs> from a point blank. Said, um, just to sum it up, that like, what what should we call accessibility settings to make them more um, usable by people who don't need accessibility or, just get people or to, don't feel like to notice accessible. that they're there more? Um, what I've been pushing for is duplicating settings. So our accessibility screen for Madden, for example, has volume control on it. However, we still have a volume control screen. So it's easy, if you need settings that are likely going to affect that type of thing, I, I strongly recommend accessibility menus, but I also recommend those settings be someplace else too. Yeah. Yeah. I think it boils down to like, we want it to be recognizable as accessibility because it's important, but we also want everyone else to feel welcome to it. So it's like catch 22, like either way, you're, something's not gonna be perfect. But uh, yeah, I think for the most part, once people get used to seeing that tab and what goes in that tab, they'll be more familiar with it, more accustomed to it. Um, so yeah, I think it's just time really, and yeah. Okay, So Thank maybe you. eventually accessibility settings will just be called settings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah or even by default, at the beginning of the game, it would ask you if you need these set of settings. So you get some people may not know where to find them. So if they ask by default, then I think even the new Spider-Man game is a great example. Yeah, for games like Madden, um, what, decides, what we decide to put in the accessibility screen really is what do you want available when someone first starts playing the game? Because the settings menu itself is not available during install. However, the accessibility menu is always available. So any mm. setting we want people, people to be able to change from the beginning, we put in that menu so we know they can immediately change it. That reminds me, I hate any game that starts up gameplay before letting you do settings. <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. It was amazing. Um, anyway, I'm so emotional right now. But like, actually, uh, I have a, actually a question, a suggestion. I don't know what you guys think about it. Because he mentioned that he would use different controls and different things to play the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very difficult to set up, right? Uh, do you have anything that we could do in the developer process, for example, not necessarily uh, besides the accessibility controls that I totally agree mm -hmm. that we should uh, have settings, but also maybe something in the back end 
end to kind of a plugin or something that can connect with the controller to make his life better in order to, for example, I use these tools and then if I use this plugin, I can auto set up the plugin, the, the control for this game. And then every game has some kind of plugin or whatever that you can just like say, I'm going to use this controller with this game and then everything is going to be very easy to set up. So have anything like that that we can do uh, to include in your process that you guys think is valuable as well? I know with a lot of the devices I use, um, like the quad stick joystick one, there are settings that you can use. Like, Say you always want to use the Xbox 360 controller. Um, every game that uses, has that compatibility would use it pretty easily. My situation is very unique in that I'm very complicated. Um, but I, I, I don't know if there would be a perfect solution hardware-wise or design-wise. But I do think having all the settings and controls published prior to the launch of the game is very important. And I also think being able to at least demo or try the game before you purchase it is important because I mean, if I buy a game and I can't play it, it's a horrible experience, right? So, yeah. I think in terms of software, one idea might be to reverse engineer the whole thing. So maybe have a game so people can play to find out what they need. So that might give them some suggestion. So that might be one way, I would say. So. I, I think all. I think uh, th the thoughtfulness in the design is a great process. And to go what Karen said, like every stage of the design process, that should be thought about and applied. And you know, we are already thoughtful designers, but I think it's just taking it to that next level. And um, you know, what I see from my game designers is the ability now, where we go through interns every semester or whatnot, or every year, and they graduate and they move on. But they can, the next set can come in and just kind of plug and play and create their own experience for our bionic kids. And that's really important. So there's Unity libraries. And I think just the discussion that we're having now really starts that, that process. It, 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 it kind of plants the seed. And we always say it's contagious. It's a good kind of contagious, though, because it, it makes you think about it when you take that approach. And that's a lot of the talks over the past two days have been about that, about that thoughtfulness. And the word thoughtfulness is really important. Um, whether it's it's for accessibility or otherwise, but I, I think you know there's no end-all solution yet, but this is the start of it. Yeah, I think also the so uh, the VTR example I uh, explained later, earlier. So that might be just have the foundation, and then based on your needs, mm -hmm. you can add what whatever you need. So again, not the perfect solution, but you can start from somewhere. And just add one more thing that I thought of. Um, it kind of goes back to participating in this de design process. I've tried so many early access games that aren't, I can't play them. I can't even use some of my joysticks. They don't work for some reason. So being able to have, like, every time I do an early access game, I'm like, you need to have these settings in before you worry about all these other things. Like, if you don't have that in, how are we going to even test it and be a part of that process? So. Yeah, I think having those things in for testing phases is very critical. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So uh, thank you so much, the whole panel. So like, thanks. thanks.